Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, Truth Seekers, and Truth Crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise, and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. Hey, before we get started with today's show, I just want to draw your attention to new merchandise. Funkin' Stuff and Truth and Rhythm designs are in, and they look pretty darn cool. So show your support, help support the program, and show off some stylish merchandise and apparel. Only at the Funkin' Stuff store. I am honored to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership, Maruga Booker a highly accomplished drummer who has defied easy categorization during his eclectic 60-plus year career. Distinguishing himself in jazz, rock, funk, and more, he has recorded and performed with some of those genres most well-known and progressive artists. They include Bob Dylan, Ted Nugent, John Lee Hooker, Weather Report, Jerry Garcia, John Popper, and George Clinton, Bootsy Collins, and related acts like Funkadelic and the P-Funk All-Stars. The award-winning Booker has also recorded numerous projects of his own, is inventor of the Nada drum, and is an Orthodox priest with his own recording studio and church. Maruga, thank you so much for joining the show. How are you? It's an honor to be here and a real pleasure. God bless you and thank you for having me with you. I love you all. Outstanding. Thank you for being here. And, and where is here for you today? Where are you coming to us from? Ann Arbor, Michigan. And uh, I'm from Detroit. Yeah, that's. But I live in Ann Arbor. I so what was it like growing up in that musical hotbed of Detroit? And when and how did you first yeah, gravitate to music? Oh, okay. Well, uh, it's an unbelievable story how I first gravitated to music. You probably wouldn't even believe it, but. I'll, I'll give it to you. <laughs> when my mother was pregnant with me, and I was in the womb, she had something like a very bad cold or the flu. In those days, in 1942, they didn't have cough drops, so they would take Vicks vapor rub, put it on the tongue, and let it drip down. 
And as it dripped, I could smell it coming in the birth tube. And I knew that the burn would come from the VIX. The next time that happened to me, in a noetic way, it was like the spirit directed me to the inner light in my forehead. And I became I was aware of myself inside myself, with my eyes closed in, in the womb inside myself, in my own being. And in a noetic way, because you don't have a language, I knew that if I went into this light, somehow I wouldn't feel the burn. Because the burn burned from the VIX on my forming skin. And I, I would kick in, you know, in the womb. So I went into the light, and I went out of my body beyond, and I didn't feel the pain. Now, getting to the point, the next time this happened to me, my mother, I found out years later, used to go every Saturday to the Latin Quarter to hear Panchito. And so in the womb, I smelt the fume coming, but other fumes too. She was drinking alcohol, and I think I was getting a buzz in the womb. I think I got a buzz in the womb before anybody got a buzz, you know, and, but also the buzz of the light. And I went into the light, and as I was going into the light, I heard, that kind of groove going, and people laughing, and glasses clinking. Well, years later, I found out that was Panchito's band. And actually, at the uh, last uh, concert of Colors, I played with Panchito's drummer. And he told me that he they played at the uh, at the Latin Quarter all the time, and that Panchito was from Detroit. And he played with Stan Kenton, and he was an educator. So in the womb, I heard drums, and in the womb, I saw the light. <clears throat> that directed me to, to the priesthood, to yoga, to being a musician. You know, they say God is sound, the cosmic sound vibration. You know, for the Christian, it's the logos in the beginning is the word, vibration. And for the yogi, it's, it's the om. So when you tune to music, you tune to your own spirit. And you, because you are tuning to the intuitive, uncreated potential of God within yourself that expresses itself through the intuition and starts playing through you. So I tell people I don't play the, the instrument. I'm playing myself through the instrument. In myself is the ground of being, spiritual ground of being, that is the intuition. And so I like to, uh, I, I concentrate, people say, well, why do you concentrate on, on God and source all of that so much? I said, well, because if I concentrate on the source of the music, I don't have to worry about the music as much. The music takes care of itself because you tap into the, where it comes from, within yourself. A lot of people are thinking when they play, and they're thinking, what I want to play Oh, I got to play this, and that'll be cool. I'll do this, and I'll do that. And then they stop themselves from uh, playing something beyond their preconceptions, something intuitive, something new. And so, you know, that's why George is new. He's on the one. It doesn't just mean on the one beat. It means on the one of unity in, in, in spirituality. When I was on the road, you know, George said to me, hey, we're playing. I'm playing the congas actually like I heard in the womb, right? And George says, you know where the funk comes from? I said, where? He says, from the gospel. That's why I wrote a new song with my friend Justin Bridges. You know, it might be funk to you, but it sure is gospel to me. So then that was the first place. Then at the age of five, my father played the accordion. He's Serbian. And he played the accordion in the kitchen. And I'm in the kitchen along with my mother and my father and me. And he's having a coffee, and uh, uh, he's playing the accordion, and it had rhinestones on it. it said Bookfish with the rhinestones, and he's pulling it. And, well, I mean, that was like a psychedelic trip to see those rhinestones and the accordion going back and forth. And what better thing can you have than the father's love playing dance music, colo dance music, in your kitchen, and your mother holding your hand dancing in circles? 
that's ecstasy. I would go entranced and just then a week later, my mother put a pencil in my hand and she says, "Here's how you do a stick figure." And I said to her, "I was only three. And I says, "No, uh, there are people who are not sticks. They have a shape." So I was already thinking form and all of this kind of stuff at the age of three, three, four, and five. Right? It was actually three when I saw saw my father play the accordion. Around five, I'm listening to the uh, radio. Put another nickel in in the Nickelodeon. All I want is you and music. And then, you know, uh, come take a trip on the magic carpet, the magic carpet of your dreams. You know, I start saying, well, the carpet of my dreams, you know, music, you know, and that makes me feel so good. You know, so that was all just instilled. And then I would go to the Serbian hall, and while well, these guys would be playing colo circle music, you know, it's, it's gypsy, gypsy circle dance, Serbian gypsy circle dance, you know, like, I, and they all do it, you know, the, 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 the the uh, the uh, uh, Jewish do the circle dance and the Turks do a circle dance and this circle dance it's not a sexual dance it's man and woman holding hand in hand going in circle and dancing in the energy of life you know uh, the other dance is the polka or the rumba or the cha cha or the waltz or something I hold you close you know that's more sensual but the circle dance. It's it, it's this energy where people are dancing in a circle fast, and they're dancing in that circle, and it gets uh, frantic, you know. So that's where I got my uh, early early stuff. And then in Detroit, of course, you know, I would go to the butchers club and hear all of these accordion players in the poppy houses with my dad, and then you hear the blues guys, you know. Well, when I heard Little Richard on uh, on my little transistor radio. Uh, you know, sing Tutti Frutti, I was done. I said, I got to play rock and roll. And I, by that time, I was playing accordion because I started playing accordion at the age of six with my teacher, Misha Bishkov. I got a scripture here. Misha. <laughs> Good old Misha. You know, he had the Warsaw Music Store on Hamtramck, right? It, there he is, see? Misha. In the Warsaw Music Store, Hamtramck. And Gene Krupa used to come in to see him, who played with Benny Goodman, their famous drum soloist. And Krupa used to come in and get tips from him, because Misha had that giz, gypsy klezmer, Jewish-Russian, traveled through China. He was very well-versed. He was more avant-garde and the, maybe the first kind of Jimi Hendrix that there was. Why? Because he had a 10-foot accordion. A 10-foot accordion with a ladder that he had to crawl up and down. It was on wheels, and his wife had to pull it. You see? And he walked up and down and played it. But when he came out on stage, he would come out with his hands behind his back, holding a concertina, playing the flight of the bumblebee. And most people can't even do that with their accordion in front. He's playing it on a concertina in the back of his body. They don't even know he's got an instrument. But they're hearing the concertina. So he had that kind of vibe. And he played brushes, and he tied them to rubber bands. So he'd be playing, and then he'd throw a brush at you, and just when you think it's going to hit you in the face, you pull it back with the rubber band, <laughs> you know, when people were standing close to the stage, right? So he, he had a sense of outness. You know, he juggled, uh, you know, tambourines on a stick while he was playing the drums. You know, uh, he, he, he was out of the box. And that was all my really early influence. And then don't forget, Bill Haley and the comics come from around here, you see. And early rock and roll in Detroit. And then I started uh, listening to the Thunder Rocks. And then I played with the Low Rocks in 1958. I joined the Low Rocks. And we were playing opposite Ronnie Hawkins and the Hawks and, and, and the Supremes and the Shirelles and all of that by the 60s, you know, with the Low Rocks. And so... We had a hit in five states. I'm 16 with a hit in five states, playing for 3,000 screaming teenagers in 1959 and 60, right? So I knew then and there that was my life. I wanted to be a musician. Wow. That's it. Yeah. I mean, that's such a great uh, <laughs> background of the being a vessel, you know, for the force of music to just flow through um, as this kind of universal shared energy um 
It, that's exactly what it is. It's a universe. I tell people we're a cosmic organism. See, so that's why George says we're on the one. We're on the one. I believe you know, it. I mean, nothing. One cosmic organism. Nothing is more spiritual to me than than the you know the effect music has. So I, I'm with you. Um, what? How did you end up settling on drums? Well, of course, again, I heard the drums in the womb. Right. So I was always attracted to them, but getting turned out to the accordion first that I saw that first before a drum I started accordion at the age of six and I played it till 14 and I was trying to play I want instead of Serbian songs I was trying to play I walked the line yeah <laughs> you know Johnny Cash you know, it's the, and one day I'm walking down Seven Mile Road and I see a car go by it says accordion players go to jail. And then I saw another one that said accordion players go to hell. And right then, I, you know, I saw it on these bumper stickers, you know, going down the street. And I said, my God, I'm playing the wrong instrument. They don't like accordion. And so then I said, I need to pick another instrument. And I was in, in grade school, you know, the seventh, eighth grade. And I said to myself, I got to pick it now, and I'm not going to do anything else in my life until I find out what instrument I want to play. So then I would go to the park, and I'm going, love me tender, love me true, and I'm on a swing and say, no, nah, I'm not going to be a singer. <laughs> you know, uh, the, 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 you know then, then I started thinking, are, you know, I says, well... You know, that's a lot of strings and all. You know, I, I just don't, I, I don't get it right off the bat. You know, I'm young. I'm 14, you know. And uh, I'm thinking, what, you know, did I go to the, I go to the uh, Lightyard Armory and I see the Low Rocks, the band I ended up making the hit with. And this is just before and I stopped and playing and 3,000 kids screaming at them. And I said, I want to play the drums, I think. And then I went to Nolan High School, and I'm dancing at the sock hop. You know, they had the guys there. Ah, smoking boo, ah, hey, ah, smoking boo. I went to Chinatown. Yeah, I didn't know boo was talking about grass. They were just saying, Ling Ting Tong, I want to sing the song, I smoking boo. And I'm doing the chicken, and my hands are going like that, and my feet are, and I noticed that my hand was hitting the cymbal. The right hand was hitting the cymbal when I was going like that, and my left hand was on the back beat. And my feet were in, in sync with the bass drum and the sax symbol to dance because music is to dance to as well, you see. Mm -hmm. So I noticed that I'm sort of like playing air drums when I dance, like guys play the air guitar. I'm playing air drums, man, and I'm dancing and I'm going up the cat. And then I saw Jim McCarty from The Wheels. The guitar player from the Wheels. He played with Buddy Miles and Jimi Hendrix and uh, you know, Cactus, but he was a drummer before he was a guitar player. And I saw him do a drum solo, and it was a Gene Krupa kind of drum solo. And then that sort of ticked it off. I says, "Yeah, uh, Misha plays the drums. My accordion player plays drums. I'm going to get him to teach me." And he taught Gene Krupa. So. I started playing the drums. Well, my father said, if you bring a drum home, you and your mother are both going out. <laughs> and one day, I got my dad a little teed off. I was on a bike with a siren. I wanted to see how loud it go at 30 miles an hour. And he said, stop. And I wouldn't stop. And I went around the blocks two, three times with the siren. <laughs> driving everybody crazy. So I finally had to bring the bike back. He says, walk home. So I had to walk home a mile and a half. Then he came home, and he goes and gets my accordion. He says, come out to the alley. I go out to the alley. He says, see your accordion? I says, yeah. He threw it on the ground, and he stepped on it. Now, I didn't want to tell my dad I didn't want to play accordion because he said my, my mom and me would have to leave the house. <laughs> you know, he'd kick us out, right? So I wasn't saying too much. But I looked up to him after he 
broke my accordion. I said, gee, thanks, Dad, for breaking my accordion because I didn't want to play it. I want to play the drums. You and your mother are going out if you bring in a drum. You know, well, my dad wanted to play the accordion when he was a young boy in Serbia because his mother had a nightclub where famous singers came. She had a hemp farm, a poppy farm, a nightclub, and a place where you stay overnight, like a hotel, and hit songs were made in her nightclub, and they made their own Slivovica whiskey and wine and all of that, right? And he wanted to play, but all the accordion players, you know, were luscious. They liked to drink a lot of Slivovica, and she says, you're not going to be a musician, you're going to be a shoemaker. So he hated her for that. So... He went to his accordion teacher, which was my accordion teacher, and also uh, my drum teacher. And, he, and Misha says, Melvin, you're not letting your son play the drums. He says, if he brings home a drum, him and his mother's going out. He's got to play accordion. You can't play a wedding with just a drum, but an accordion player can play a wedding by himself. <laughs> you know, that's how he was thinking, right? And my, and my teacher says to him, Melvin, how do you like your mother? I can't stand the bitch. He, he didn't love her on one end, you know. But because of that part, you know, he could I can't stand the bitch. He said, do you see what you just said to your mother? He says, yeah, why? He says, she didn't let me play accordion. I said, he says, well, you're not letting your son play the drums. He's not going to stand the bastard. And my dad looked at him. He says, you're right. And then he went to Gasopi Music Store. And he bought me a set of drums, put it on the account, said he's going to get it for Christmas. Bought a set of sticks and a music pad and brought it home. And I come home and after school and I'm looking. I can't get in the door. It's locked. And I see through the screen door that there's a drum pad and some sticks on the table there. Man, my heart went boom, boom. Where did that come from? And my dad says, okay, you can play the drums, damn it. He says, no, I bought you a set of drums. It's October. He says, uh, do you want them now or do you want them in December for Christmas? I says, now. I'm joining the Low Rocks. You know how I joined that band that I saw, I saw playing and I said, I want to be with those guys? I was at Big Boys on 8 Mile Road eating my Big Boy. And a dude came in and said, bro. The Low Rocks are down the block, about a half a mile from here, having a party. Let's go crash it. That's the band that I saw. I said, I want to go I want to go see those guys. So I went, and just as I opened the door, I went to open the door, knock. I was knocking on it. The door slams open. Out comes the drummer of the Low Rocks, saying, screw you all, I quit the band. And he walked away, leaving his drums there. I walked in the basement, and the guitar player says, is there a drummer in the house? Because they were ready to play the party, <laughs> right? I says, I'm here. I played the first set. They said, you're in the band. Within six months, we recorded and made a hit record. Five states got up to number one from top 40 down to number one. Jack Scott, uh, you know, uh, we were playing Jack Scott's Barn. Uh, Tom Play was playing us. Lou Reed, Jack the Bellboy, all of these guys were playing our record. C K L W X Y Z J J Z. You know, all of the big stations were playing it. And I went to, within that year. I went next time I went to the big boys. I heard the song coming out of the speakers of radios and cars. Twenty cars in the big boys, and they're all playing my hit. And I'm there having my big boy. You see, now it wasn't because of a manager. It's because of it's meant. It's meant. It's the vibration. You know, if if you're meant to do it, if you tune to what you like and what you love, it's going to happen. Wow, <laughs> went full circle right there. Um, so mm -hmm. let's uh, let's uh, shift up. The impetus to not never quit. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. What? I said absolutely. Yeah. Let's let's um, shift forward a little bit, um, and you know, I mean, you've played with so many people, but um, let's touch on some highlights, um, like John Lee Hooker. You know, how did that come I was to be? At the chess mate. 
Well, number one, you know, I'm in high school, you know, play, starting drums and stuff, and I got my own little transistor. You know, it's about the size of a cell phone. <laughs> you know, I'm rocking around like that, you know, and I hear, you know, boom, to doom, to doom, to doom, to doom, to doom, ow, ow. And I hear John Lee Hooker on the radio. And I heard that John Lee Hooker and Jimmy Reed and Howard Wolf and Muddy Waters uh, before I heard anything else, you know. And, and so those guys were my heroes. So now I'm the house drummer in the house band at the chess mate. And they used to give me the nickname Boom Boom Booker. So now John Lee gets booked at the chess mate. Now, I, I told you about the early days of listening to so you know how much I loved Booker. You know? and, and now I'm sitting at home. I just did a song. It's actually on the Booker Bridges Delight album. And it's called Paid Your Dues. And it's about meeting Hooker. So I'm sitting home with my mother's house. I'm sitting in the living room. And I hear the phone go, ding, ding, ding. I said, uh, hello. It says, bu, 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 this is Hooker. It's Booker there. I said, this is he. He, he said, well, well, well Maury Wattenbaum told me that uh, you're Boom Boom Booker and that I play Boom Boom and that we should get our booms together and play live blues at the chess mate. I said, sir, you're my hero. I'd be honored to play with you. He said, come, come tonight. Because he, he stuttered. You know, sometimes you know, when you would talk to him, he would stutter. Never when he sang. <laughs> Just, you know, you know, he talked sort of like that. I think the stutter was sort of part of his uh, blue slang. <laughs> you know, what you gonna do, 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 do tonight? <laughs> you know. Well, he says, come down to the chess mate. So I went down. My drums were already there. I'm the house drummer. I'm sitting there waiting. I remember the door opening up. Here he comes in with an amp and a guitar. Right? Now you see guys, that, you know, they come with a big van, a big truck, everybody booing it in. And, you know, this guy is coming 10 minutes before the gig with a guitar in, in, in an amp out of a taxi cab. He said, bah, 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 bah. I pulled the taxi cab to bring me down to River Noise in Six Mile Road. And here I am. And then he comes up to me and he says, now, he says, Booker? I said, yes, sir. He says, you're, you're playing with the hooker. Wherever I go, you go. And what he meant it in those early days, because he wasn't playing with bands too much, Sometimes, just because he wanted to, he would turn the beat around. You know, doom to John to doom to John to John to boom to John. You know, and it would turn around. And so he said, you know, if I turn it around, you turn around. If I don't turn around, you don't turn around. Wherever I go, you go. I said, yes, sir. Well, so then I started developing a style that didn't play the backbeat as much. It was playing the bass drum. Boom. Boom. And then my... Instead of going doom to ba, doom to ba, I would go bam 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 And then if I saw he had it locked in, I would start accentuating the backbeat. And then if he turned it around, I take the backbeat away. But I just keep the same momentum, right? After a while, that didn't happen anymore. Uh, we kept right in time and we grooved. You know, he got out of his folk uh, solo bag. You know. And it started getting in that group. So we were the first. I, they booked us there, Hooker and Booker. We were equals, Hooker and Booker. And I used to hire them to come and jam with me at the. For 50 bucks, I would get them to come and sing three songs. At, you know, down, down at the uh, red carpet. <laughs> you know, then I played at the 20 grand with them in different places like that. So it, it, sometimes it was just me and him, sometimes his sons in me. His son and the friend, and then other times my band. My horn player played with Charlie Parker, so he was a real cooker, you know. And uh, uh, so we he, we were the first white rhythm and blues jazz rock band that he played with. So by the time, and that was from 65 to about 70, 71, on and off. So when he went to California and met Ken he. He was already used to playing with us guys, you know, with the white, you know, more of a heavy 
metal rock sound on a guitar, though our guitar player could play anything, you know. It, but we were giving him more of a, you know, more of a can heat sound, you know, uh, than the old-fashioned blues sound, you know, because that's where everybody was at that time. Then he went, and when he went with Ken Heat, he felt very comfortable with that because he was used to that with us. And that's sort of how the hooker thing came about. I call him the godfather, uh, uh, my godfather of blues, and he drank Shivers Regals. And so I said, you got to respect your teachers. you got to respect the elders and the teachers. So, you know, I said, sir, what do you drink? He said, I drink Shivers Regals. So when I came to the gig, I had a pint or a fifth of sugars regals. And I and, and, and I come up to him and I say, Sir, thank you for letting me play with you. <laughs> Here you sit down and we'll have a couple of shots and then we'll play the blues. <laughs> right? It's very, very um, um, moving. Then later on I realized, you know, that he was a juju man. He, he was a spiritualist, the juju man. Look at his last album. The healer, right? Mm, yeah, that's what you know, because he comes from the African healing juju tradition. John Lee Hooker. How how did you feel at that time? You know, when all the British acts were replicating what the blues guys had done, and the blues guys weren't getting that kind of attention and acclaim, and were sort of pushed to the side. You know, while the Eric Clapton's and the and the Stones and all that were getting such success, did that cross your mind at all? Yeah, but it, it crossed my mind more when when I heard Hendrix. Because yeah, yeah. here's what happened. See, not equating us to Hendrix, but but we were young, and in 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 in, in the '59 and '60, I was with the Thunder Rocks. And they had what's the word Thunderbird? What's the joy Nature Boy? What's the word Thunderbird? You know, real punk rock and roll garage music. You know, and and I was playing with those guys, and we even started the Wall Lake Casino. You know where, uh, uh, you know we backed up Stevie Wonder and uh, the the Contours, a lot of different people, but. We built our own amplifiers in 1959 because the bass player was an electrician. So we had six foot long amps. The guitar amp was six feet long, about two and a half feet wide, and about a foot and a half, you know, uh, deep. And we had, the guitar had two fifth, two two twelves to fifteen and four tweeters. And the bass had two bass fifteens, a twelve in a leader and they were on these legs so they were even to my head next one on one side and one on the other and we were a trio and we were rocking out sustained you know you know with the with our own amps right that we made back then and then we hear Jimi Hendrix and we said holy shit he beat us to the concept you know not to the notes not to the song but to the concept, you know, and when the cream came out, we say, shit, you know, we, we, we missed it. You know, that's actually what we said. We missed it. You know, like uh, we, we blamed ourselves, you know, for not getting your own self out. But what, what is it that we were doing? We were doing power, trio, sustained, sort of psychedelic, you know, guitar, bass, and drums. I had double bass drums, <laughs> right? Trio. And we used to rock the house. He could sing any of it, Pat LaRose. He could go from Ben Atkins to West Montgomery to Barney Kessel, you know, uh, to Jimmy Reed, John Lee Hooker, Junior Wells. It didn't matter. Uh, you know, Pat did it. Now, that's another guy at the chess mate that I played with, the Junior Wells and Buddy Guy. You know, see? And then just around that same time, I had the opportunity to play with Jimmy Reed, you know? He, he said, now, don't, see those big symbols? I said, yeah, he said, those are jazz. Don't play it. So I want you to play the floor tom and snare with the bass drum and sock. Like gut bucket. He said, this is gut bucket blues. You know, see, it's not just a blues, see. Gut bucket blues, a folk blues, 
rhythm and blues. You see, uh, there's different kind of blueses, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's all coming from where? It all comes from juju. Juju comes from Africa. Humanity comes from Africa. Oh, that's I cannot understand racism one iota because we all come from Africa. Down in there, you know, okay, before that, the Neanderthal man, and that was there, he probably came out of Africa and then went to, into, into Europe and came back to Africa and all of this stuff. But, you know, I'm part Neanderthal, so I can, I can <laughs> you know, I'm not putting Neanderthal down. I'm part Neanderthal. <laughs> I just did my genealogy to Neanderthal. <laughs> I said, yeah, man, I got some of that, you know, <laughs> right? But how, how did blues you... comes from there. So if you love, it, it just comes from Africa. The blues comes from there. So, you know, we got to, like, tune to that. Yeah. Um, how, how did you um, connect with Ted Nugent? We were all rocking at the same clubs at the same time. Because I was the house drummer at the chess mate, the chess mate was putting me in the free press and news, both papers twice in three times a week ads and I began to be a pretty famous drummer in 65 to 70 in Detroit and on top of that I was playing along with Hal McKinney his band and my band after I was at the chess mate with Jack Sorrell WJZZ which I'm thankful WJZZ uh, just gave me the WJZZ award. It came full circle. <laughs> right? Yeah. Right? Yeah. There but, it is. You know, thank God for that. I, I was known in playing a lot of the, uh, the places like the East Town, the Chess Mate, the Grandy. And playing these places, I had a chance to meet Nugent and jam with them. <clears throat> and we got to be good friends. And so everywhere he would play, I would jam with him. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, I even remember playing with Nugent in Livonia, and after us came on Iggy Pop. So at that time, we were playing these clubs. They were big clubs, the Pumpkin and the different places. Nugent was playing there, Bob Seeger was playing there. Alice Cooper. They were all just starting off. Alice Cooper was just starting off, biting off the heads of rubber chickens. <laughs> you know, it was all just starting off. This this whole kind of music was happening. It was just happening. And we just happened to live there, and we were part of the people that were part of that happening. In, in wonderful Detroit, is a melting pot of, you know, blues and rock. Alvin Jones, the Jones brothers, you know, Alvin from Coltrane comes from, you know, um, Pontiac, you know, from the Michigan, Detroit area. And, you know, Bill Haley in the comments, John Lee Hooker was here. You know, all of these, uh, Motown, and then with Motown being here, it, it was a, um, it was a fantastic energy that was going on because there was hundreds of clubs. I could go to five or ten clubs in one night, do drum solos and make money at each one of them. Just doing drum solos. So, you know, that way I met Nugent, jammed with Nugent, and we got to be very good friends. We're still in contact. Uh, actually, he used to jam with me, and my old, uh, I used to do a riff. Yeah, that's, I, read, I read that you had yeah, set the foundation for Stranglehold. Yeah, it, 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 you know, and it, it, that happened, you know, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm uh, thrilled about that, but that, that one of my riffs, it wasn't a, it was a riff song, because we were into acid rock improvisation off of a riff, you know, uh, and, uh, well, it's wonderful, you know, to feel that something that you did influenced someone to go make a big hit in some other kind of way, you know, and uh, I was never uh, mad at that or 
pissed off or anything. I, I was really uh, happy about it. A actually, uh, my daughter took me to this, uh, to her boyfriend's, where she had a boyfriend whose father was in a metal band, and they played Stranglehold, and I was cracking up. I'm in the audience. I said, they wouldn't even believe it. You know, <laughs> you know. and well, last time I told Nugent, he said, you know, Nugent came up to me. He says, you know, I went to see him, and he says, uh, he says, you know, when I did that gig with you, that riff, he says, uh, that, that riff influenced me, and I added a few more riffs and some lyrics, and I got Stranglehold. I said, well, I'm really happy that you did, bro. You know, you got to be happy for people when they do something great. You can't be jealous. They are you. I'm one with them. This part of me got that. Well, I, 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 didn't, I didn't know until now, Maruga, that... I didn't know until now that you, you know, had a tie to that song. And that's, you know, definitely one of my favorite 70s rock songs. It's easily among the funkiest rock song. Nugent's funkiest rock song for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's... Uh, you know, I had a group called Goom. It's not that to facilitate that is John Starter was in my band Goom, right? And and I and we had a guitar player, and uh, we were the band at the chess mate, and uh, I had a horn player, Pat Bowlby. He was my mentor, and he played uh, with Charlie Parker, Claude Hornhill, Stan Getz, Woody Herman, and guys. And so he really influenced me to cook in music, you know, to get that thing, you know, to get into the spirit, the soul of the music, you know. And he influenced me very much, you know. And so uh, we were all uh, playing, and we would go at the chest, and Morty would, on the three days that he was closed, coffee shop, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, he let us go in, and we would stay in the club for three days and nights, with a bag of acid and a bag of wheat. We take a tab of acid and we stay there for three days and nights, slept on the stage and on the floor, and across the street was the hamburger joint, and we'd get the hamburgers and we'd come back to the club and we practice from morning till late night, tripping out, smoking bud. You know, it's legal now. I was legal back then. Uh, and, and uh, uh, coming up with songs, and that riff came about like that in one of these three-day sessions, right? And, and then we went and played it at East Town, and Ted and Jan with us, and he got the riff, and then he asked Sonder and me to join band. Well, I liked my band, <laughs> right? And, and I and my guitar player was the monster, Pat Rhodes. He could go from West Montgomery to Hendricks to, to, uh, to you know, to Chuck Berry, you know. Uh, so I said, no, I'm not going to go. I'll go with you because he was offering me 150 a week for a year, and then my price would go up and get a limo. And I'm saying, man, I'm already getting $350 for a 20-minute drum solo at the, at the East Town, you know, and I'm making $50 to $100 a drum solo at the Chessmate. It, you're talking 150 a week. I'm talking about I want 150 for 20 minutes. So I did. <laughs> I didn't go. But then Sauter went with him, and he knew the bass line. Right? And Newton said, I like that riff you guys were doing. And then they conjured up, and there you go. They got the song. I went in another direction because in 67, I was playing... I went to Vegas for for a part of the summer, and I played with Freddie Bell and the Bell Boys at at the um, um, opposite uh, Don Rickles uh, in the Sahara Lounge. And I had Jing one night at my house, who came to visit me, was Stefan Capelli. Are you aware of this guy? He played violin and mandolin with Django Reinhardt. Django Reinhardt came to visit me. And uh, we played for about an hour or two on my apartment floor with his violin and mandolin in my Moroccan clay drums and uh, talking drum and uh, dumbek and little bells. That was the first time that I had a chance to really play on a high level, you know, uh, 
with my hand drums, you know, with with somebody that intimate that was really that that high, you know, and with the violin like that, and that profoundly influenced me. So I I then got initiated into TM. This was in '67, and I came back to Detroit, and I was going to go with uh, Rusty Day in Detroit, but then I kept on saying, man, this. D, you know, this, this Stefan Capelli, this, you know, real subtle stuff, you know, I, I, I got attuned to that. So I went to New York, and I, it, 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 Sauter went with Nugent, I went to New York, and I ended up going with the Paul Winter Consort on a and Records. And then I had a chance to play with classical jazz and folk musicians and I was the funky part and we were on A&M Records and being produced by Paul Stuckey from Peter, Paul and Mary. So I started getting into this subtler kind of music and then Paul wasn't stretching out enough so I quit him and the next week or two I ended up playing Woodstock with Tim Harden. And then I came back to New York, and uh, uh, I started, you know, tapping into, you know, that kind of stuff. And I got this Woodstock thing, you know, and I said, I'm going to Detroit to put my heavier metal band together, <laughs> right? And, and at the same time, uh, here I am doing that. And now it's uh, 70, uh, 70 or 71, and I'm on an acid trip, and somebody comes to the house, my friend Betty, and she says, we're going to New York. So I'm on an acid trip. I said, okay, I'll go with you, and I just hopped in the car. At a gas station, I saw a book that, Press Jewel of Discrimination talking about the third eye, and I read that all the way up to New York on an acid trip. I get to New York to my friend Perry Robinson's house, because that's who we knew, and uh, I walk in, and Perry says, hey, man, this group, new group, weather report, their manager just called you. They want you to play with them, and I didn't even have any drums, but I, my friend had a little jar drum I gave him a couple months ago. I said, can I use the jar drum I gave you? It's Israeli clay jar drum. Excellent jar drum. So said, yeah. He wanted me to do the session that afternoon. So I got the jar drum. I went to the music inn, and I bought a $25 pair of Moroccan clay drums. And I bought some bells, a flexitone, and, and a, uh, which is like a little dinghy. And I and I got a microphone uh, 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 you thing that holds the microphone that you could blow in. It sounds like a whistle. And... And I got a Fisher Price baby roller toy, and that's what I went to the weather report session with. Right? <laughs> you know, uh, all these years I'm waiting to play with great guys like this, and I don't even have drums with me, <laughs> right? So that ended up being Sweet Nighter, you know. And then I came back to Detroit. And I started, you know, going out with my own music at the chess mate, more influenced by, you know, from Woodstock to Weather Report and, uh, and all of that really got me out. Then I ended up playing with Brubeck uh, as a result because through Paul Winter, I what, met what, 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 what were the Weather Report guys like? They were wonderful. You know, they were really wonderful. Actually, they, they were all very high conscious people. Right, they were people too, going through their own kind of changes. They were all looking to see. Before that happened, I met Joe Zawino a year before that. I was playing at Cobo Hall at uh, the Detroit Jazz Festival, seventy seventy one, somewhere around there, and opposite Lou Rawls. And I was playing with um, um, <coughs> Rufus Harley, the jazz bagpipe player. Player, he played. You know, Love Supreme on bagpipes. And so we were playing funky jazz on bagpipes. And 
Rufus would be going, and you got to stop the war, and you all are, you know, that and that. And, and the promoter grabbed him off stage and said, you got to stop rapping that crap. And, and while he grabbed him off, Rufus says, do a drum solo. So I did a drum solo, and I played my trap drums, and I played my hand drums, and I got a standing ovation because those speakers were really big. It made my sound made the sound of the hand drum sound like cannons, you know, and, and I worked off of it. And I got a standing ovation, a great write-up, and when I walked off stage, Joe Zawano came up to me and said, hey man, here's my number if you're in New York, stop and see me. So, right then, about the same time, I happened to get a, a divorce from my first wife, and uh, I was feeling down, and I went to New York, and I went to see Joe Zawano. And we hung out all day. We smoked weed and drank wine and listened to music. And he was showing me this very spacey music. Now, musically, it was fantastically avant-garde and spacey. New Age before New, you know, new Age, in a sense. And that's what he was playing. Well, the record company said to him, we don't want that. We want more Mercy Mercy. Because he wrote Mercy Mercy for Cannonball which is funky jazz. They said, we want more funky jazz. We don't want this stuff, right? So then when I was playing at the uh, recording at, at the record plant, John Lennon's engineer, Shelly Yakis, and we're recording there. I'm recording on a track for Al Cooper from Blood, Sweat, and Tears. But with Al Cooper, it's Naked Songs album and uh, a song called... Um, Peacock Lady, I'm on. And, um, okay, so right there at that session, Weather Report's manager was there. And um, he took my number. He said, do you play rock and jazz and blues? I said, yeah. He said, I need your number. So that's who called me when I arrived on the acid trip to the Perry's house. Wow. And that's how all of that stuff happens. Didn't happen through no agent. I never had an agent. When 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 did you first meet George Clinton, and what was your first impression? Again, I met George Clinton at the chessmate, and I'm at home, and Maury Weidenbaum, the owner of the chessmate, calls me up and says, "Hey, man, you gotta see these guys, man. They're really weird. I mean, they got weird sunglasses, real big sunglasses, and big hairdos." And they're funky. You got to come down. They were setting up, you know, and practicing. It was George Clinton's six-piece group. That was the group. Whoa, that was the stuff, man. That's the jit. <laughs> you know. And I went down there and I said, "Holy shit, man! That was really groovy." But what I didn't know is, at the same time, George was coming to see me play at the Chessmate and going to see me play down at Baker's Keyboard Lounge. And he really liked my playing. So now, one day in the 70s, they called him Big Bernie, Bernie Mendelssohn, the producer. He produced Maggot Brain and all that. He met me. Uh, I did a session for him with uh, Fantastic Four, Night People. And he then told Bootsy and Frankie what, what, uh, from, from the funk about me, and they came to my house and they saw me play my hand drums and stuff. So then they asked me to come down and record at Pack 3 with George. And this was in, like, 79. And so I recorded with George in 79 at Pac-3. Have a... Yeah, that came after that, see? And that was how that happened is, yeah, electric spanking for war babies, right? Yep. Yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, so that happened because of that session at Pac-3, George knew about me. Then, after Weather Report, uh, I come to Detroit, and I see that there's this guy on 
television with a hit song, and he's only been playing guitar for six months. And he didn't know how to do nothing. He was just punked out and just, just playing it, you know. Didn't know what he was doing. But it was a hit. And I said, shit. I got too highfalutin. I went out so far out, weather report, and after weather report, I played with Perry and got their hand and went avant-garde so far out that people didn't even know what I was doing. But it was good spiritually for me. And um, I says, I got to go down like when I was 14 and had the first hit with the low rocks. That's how I got to think, right? And at the time, you know, uh, new wave and punk music was coming out. So... I created a band called the Soda Jerks, and uh, I bought a guitar at a hawk shop for 75 bucks. Ted Lucas taught me how to tune a guitar to open tuning, so it's an open E. My bass player friend showed me how to bar it and get to four and five. I'm just a drummer. I don't know that. You know, I could do it on accordion, but I didn't know the guitar. And so in two weeks, I wrote... 22 songs that are like new wave punk stuff and you know I got phasers and flanders on my guitar so you know that it was that kind of a flourish instead of far out chords and in in playing fast you know I got weird sound you know all of that kind of on my guitar my guitar became a melodious drum right well my friend Joey Z was George Clinton's uh, roadie, road manager. And so he told George what I was doing. And George says, I want to meet him. And that's when George was doing uh, that album you just showed me at the Disc LTD in East Point, Detroit. That's where all the funk was recorded, aside from United Sounds. It was the disc. Because George rented the disc for five years. You know, like if you pay a guy $150,000, if you get a million-dollar contract and you can pay a guy $150,000 a year to just let you use his studio. You know, this is before the studios were all, you know, you could have one like I got one and I have my own studio. You know, then you couldn't. And uh, so George said, anybody that can play with Weather Report, and, and I already had lived like a monk for two years, as a celibate monk, you know, with Swami Satchidananda after Woodstock, right, uh, between be, uh, between 70 and 72, and uh, and then came back to Detroit and put together the Soda Jerks. He says, anybody that can, you know, go play Woodstock and Carnegie Hall with Rubeck and, and then come over here and, and weather report, and then you go and you're, you're a Soda Jerk now? You got a contract sight unseen, unheard. And he gave me all oh, maybe a hundred thousand dollars worth of studio time, but I lived in the studio with George for five years. What what was George, the what was the first year? Eighty to eighty five. Right, and the the, the 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 studio was just three miles from my house, and George's kids were staying upstairs in my house. You know, uh, Tracy. You know, in. Uh, uh, the the other bro, I for, I'm sorry, Darryl? I forgot his name. Daryl, he he passed away. Yeah. Daryl and and Tracy and, and Jimmy were all staying at my house, right? And and they became part of the Soda Jerks because I was saying it's pop on the rocks music. And what was pop? God. What's the rock? Earth. George thought that Soda Jerks meant the soda in the free base. <laughs> Right? So, you, you see, the olden days, you could say one word, two words, and one group of people is going to think you're saying this. The other group of people is thinking you're saying that. And open that's to interpretation. Yeah. yeah, that you could leave it open to interpretation. Right? So, I became the Soda Jerks, and he, he nicknamed me Dr. Jerkenstein, <laughs> and, and, and said that you're a lifetime P-Funk all-star. And so now I'm there. I am on their site, uh, you know. But I did all of those albums because I was doing my own album. He said you could have anybody you want, but I didn't want anybody that knew how to play an instrument playing in my band. You see, because I didn't know how to play the guitar, 
So I put my wife on drums. She sings. So you got to play the drums. I did take a bass player that was a bass player, but he was a jazz and classical bass player in very straight, in, in very astute. So I made him be the bass player for the Soda Jerks. <laughs> right. So he was like in a domain that he was not used to. And that's what I wanted. I wanted the newness. Uh, you know, I didn't want to approach it like I knew what I was doing. That's the punk to... approach right there. Yeah, that's what I wanted, yeah. right? And that's what we did. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you very much.